my primary research interest has been in TB and HIV and all the uh, comorbidities. Now one thing about a disease like TB or HIV is it practically touches every area. So you know right from epidemiology and community work to genomics to the molecular pathogenesis to clinical trials to pharmacogenomics to pharmacokinetics and then to prevention and then community care and socio behavioral research. So it you can actually span the whole uh, spectrum of research for a disease like tuberculosis as you will see it has many other determinants apart from just the medical. So I want to run through a little bit so that you get a flavor of what because this disease is an important disease for India you will see much more coming out in the media nowadays than it used to and it is because uh, there, there has now been a commitment and a priority setting by the government to target elimination of TB which was never thought of before. TB is a very unique infection. Most times you get the infection by breathing in mycobacterium tuberculosis which can survive in dust particles for many days or weeks. Uh, so it is a very hardy bacterium. People with TB cough it out and then that gets mixed and then it. So many journalists ask me like this habit of spitting in India. Do you think it is spreading, helping to spread TB? So it's it's spreading a lot of things but uh, possibly TB as well. So then you get infected and uh, following, so what happens is the, the bacteria are into the lung, they get established there and then after infection there are a number of things that happens. The mycobacterial antigens are processed in the macrophages in the lung and then presented to the T cells and then the uh, cell mediated immune response develops it is basically a T cell mediated response and uh, you can see there on the left hand side there is a skin test a picture of a tuberculin skin test. So this is a test of a, this was a test discovered more than 100 years ago. You inject the antigen it is called a purified protein derivative and uh, then you measure the uh, infiltration after 48 hours. There is also another way of testing it and that is an in vitro test called the interferon gamma response assay which is basically looking at interferon gamma production by T cells as a after you stimulate with TB antigens. So the old way traditional way is to do it in the skin, the new way is to draw blood and do it in a test tube. But basically it tells you whether the T cells have seen the TB antigen before. So it only tells you about infection. Now, what proportion of Indians do you think are infected with TB? Any guesses? 90%. Yeah, because it's a, sometimes it's in the form of latent. Right. A lot of time it's in the form of latent. You're very right. Not quite 90%, but yes, by the time you get to 90 years, probably 90% are infected. So the curve goes like that. So in adolescence, probably about 15%. By the time you're an adult, 40% are infected. And then as you get older, you because you're, we are all exposed. So if you are living in an endemic country, you will get exposed. So this test tells you that you are infected, does not tell you you have TB disease. So this is often a confusion that people have and uh, the test, some people also you know misinterpreting the test and if you get a positive test, they say oh you have TB and you have to take treatment. If you go to the US as a student, you will get a skin test or an IGRA test and then you will be asked to take isoniazid for 9 months if you are uh, positive because they want to treat even latent infection because it is a country where there is very little TB and therefore they do not want anybody developing TB there and so you will get treated if you have latent infection. Here in India we do not treat latent infection except for one or two groups I will tell you about them young children and HIV infected people because then you will be treating you know half the population. So, so anyhow that is latent TB then you have uh, some forms of subclinical TB where there are bacteria multiplying but it is not causing any manifestations in forms of symptoms. People do not even uh, not even aware but if you culture you get positive cultures. So one does not understand really what that state is and then you have the frank clinical TB that everybody is familiar with. Now TB deaths could be a key uh, quality indicator for health systems. So if you just look at this table you can see that TB is the fifth leading cause of death in India among 30 to 69 years of age. So this shows 
that all the other causes are like cardiovascular disease and respiratory and cancer. But then in, among infectious diseases, this is the number one cause and it is still accounting for about 6 percent of uh, deaths in the adult, young adult age group. So, that is why it is a serious problem. And if you look at incidence in uh, globally, then India is number one with about 3 million new cases of whom only about half are reported to the RNTCP which is a revised national TB control program that is the government's TB program. We still lose about half a million people a year due to TB and uh, multi drug resistant TB MDR TB is about 2 to 3 percent among new cases people of having it for the first time and about 12 to 15 percent among previous cases. Now, TB is a very ancient disease, it has been there since prehistoric days and in fact, it is believed that TB also migrated out of Africa just like early man migrated out of Africa and now you have all these different lineages which can be discriminated by doing sequencing, but essentially uh, everything came out of a common pool. And now with whole genome sequencing, we see that these different lineages seem to have different propensities for drug resistance. For example, this was something we, we did whole genome sequencing of about 200 strains from South India, found majority of them were this East African Indian strain. Uh, but the Central, Afri Central Asian strain, the CAS strain had much more propensity to develop drug resistance. So, there are things about these different strains we do not understand fully there may be some mutations which are protective or which are uh, uh, making the bug more susceptible to develop resistance. Now, I was talking about uh, the epidemiology. This is a TB prevalence survey that was done in Chennai city in about 2012 and essentially just focus on one of these graphs. Let us say we take the top right hand graph which is culture positive TB. So, this is a community based survey you go in you screen the community for symptoms, you do a chest x ray and then you pick up people with either symptoms or an x ray which is abnormal and get sputum culture it. And you can see age wise and the blue line is men and the red line is women. So, first thing you notice is big difference between men and women. So, big difference between men and women as far as TB prevalence is concerned, we again do not understand quite why there seems post menopausally you can see the women the rate starts going up, but still there is there is that difference. Second thing you see is you know the weight rises up. So, between 45 and 60 years of age is the peak period and almost this is 984 out of 100,000. So, that is 1 percent of adult men in Chennai had culture positive TB. So, we can skip this basically shows all the countries that have done surveys. In India, we have not yet done a national TB prevalence survey, but from the surveys that have been done, what, what has been observed is that TB is much more prevalent than was thought and you often have people who do not have any symptoms. So, this was a survey done in Gujarat. Now, if you just, if you look at all these, uh, if the whole pie, the circle is people who have culture positive TB. Look at the green triangle, 11 percent were the people who were on TB treatment. Everybody else was either not having enough symptoms or they had gone to a doctor or some kind of healthcare provider, but they had not been diagnosed or they had been diagnosed and not started on treatment. So, only 11 out of 100 people who have culture positive TB were on treatment in this particular survey. This was a state level, statewide survey in Gujarat done a few years ago. And uh, so, it shows there are lots of people walking around who, who are probably infectious and who you know do not know it. So, again when you look at TB in children, TB in children obviously mirrors the pattern in adults and so, India again comes out as number one with about almost 200,000 pediatric TB cases per year estimated, but only less than half of those are actually reported and treated in the program. And the other important thing about, about childhood is that you can see in the first year of life, a baby who is in contact with somebody with TB in the household and gets an infection is much more likely to progress to disease, either pulmonary or extra pulmonary TB like meningitis or disseminated very severe forms 
and the risk declines with age and then goes up again during adolescence. So in infancy, it's basically a poorly developed immune system. Again, during adolescence, during pregnancy and in the postpartum period and then in old age, these are the uh, periods when people are particularly susceptible or likely to get uh, active TB. So these are some of the questions around epidemiology. We still do not know the true prevalence and we also still need to understand a lot more about the strains. I showed you the, the whole genome sequence pattern of some of the things, but unfortunately from India we have had very few uh, sequences that have been published, just a few hundred, most of them from the south. We do not know how it affects transmission efficiency, we do not know how it affects susceptibility or virulence and so on and there is some very interesting work uh, that has been done in South Africa on um, transmissibility. So what they do is they extract the air from a ward where TB patients are being treated and push it into a animal into a room of guinea pigs to see you know how long are people infectious and by doing those kind of studies they found out that once you start treatment within a few days you are non-infectious. You may be still throwing out bacteria but they are not fit enough to transmit. Um, similarly we do not know um, as to whether some strains in India are uh, more virulent. Long ago when the British started the tuberculosis research centre in Chennai, one of the observations they made, they called the South Indian strain of TB as less virulent because this was based on guinea pig experiments. But I showed you the sequencing data which shows the South Indian strains are very different from the North Indian strains. So just a clinical observation at that time and with animal studies, they had figured out that there were differences between North Indian and South Indian TB. But we have not really gone much further in that in terms of understanding and also unlike <coughs> HIV which mutates and keeps on mutating so that in a person who is infected with HIV if you draw their blood and sequence their viruses you will find so much of variability. But TB is a very stable organism. But again now the recent work which has started getting published is about is about mutations and how those mutations could be affecting the the way that the bacteria behaves so there's a lot of scope for research basic research on understanding tb pathogenesis now as far as determinants we'll go quickly the traditional risk factors are you know overcrowding poverty and all that but at the same time you have the health system uh, factors people do not uh, approach the right place for testing or for diagnosis. And for us undernutrition is a huge problem. When you read about TB you always see HIV being attached to it. That is because of all the work done in Africa where HIV is the biggest risk factor. And even in the US it was only after HIV came in in the 90s that TB started going up because by that time they had practically eliminated TB, they were comfortable, they had shut down their TB programs. But with HIV, TB came back and so did funding for TB research, though it is much lower than HIV research. And in New York and San Francisco, they started seeing cases of TB among those who were HIV positive. But for us, it is uh, really undernutrition that is the biggest risk factor. You can see the inverse correlation between a falling uh, a lower BMI and a higher risk or a higher incidence of TB. And in our own data, we analyzed the NFHS data, we found that uh, or rather Anurag Bhargav and his colleagues found that about 50 percent of cases in India could be attributable to undernutrition. So when you look at various risk factors, you can multiply it by the, you take the relative risk and then you multiply it by the proportion of that particular risk factor in the population. So HIV confers a very high risk because it really suppresses your immune system. But HIV prevalence in our population is very, very low. So when you multiply the two, it does not add up to much. Whereas if you take undernutrition, you find 30, 40 percent of our population is malnourished and then you multiply it by the relative risk, you find this 50 percent of TB can be attributable. It is called the population attributable fraction. 
uh, and so this is of serious concern and again here you find Chhattisgarh tribal areas where people's BMI is uh, low to begin with when they have TB of course they become more malnourished but even after they complete treatment you can see BMI post treatment still has not reached that 18.5 normal uh, level. So this is a problem for both uh, getting TB as well as getting cured from TB and there are many studies which have shown that if your body weight is low to begin with and you have a 3 to 4 times higher risk of dying if you get TB than if you were of uh, normal body weight or healthy body weight. There are other occupations which put people at risk. We know that smoking is a big risk factor but also exposure to dust, miners, quarry workers and all who are exposed to silica dust, they get a lot of TB. So essentially TB is not a disease that can be a, uh, probably eliminated with just the biomedical interventions unless we get a terrific vaccine which we do not have. So then you have to address all these other issues, social, environmental, behavioral and economic. And these are some of the groups that are at high risk and therefore should be screened. Now, I was telling you that a lot of people do not get their diagnosis made and it is uh, studies have shown that it takes an average of 2 months and 3 healthcare providers before a TB patient gets properly diagnosed. We also looked at the cascade of care. So, this is called the cascade of care. So, if you start with a population of TB patients like we say it is 2.8 million or 3 million in India and then you see how many were cured. If you see the last bar, it is people who had recurrence free survival for a year. That means after treatment they were fine for a year. You can see that the drop off, it is something like 40 percent. So, of 3 million TB cases that occur every year, 40 percent are ultimately cured. What is happening to the remaining? A lot of them are dying, a lot of them are chronically uh, excreting. So, these are this is a good way of looking at the quality of the program, of any program for that matter and uh, trying to fill the gaps. So, if you see at each point, did they reach the diagnostic center? Then after that, did they come back to get their report? Then did they get started on treatment? Did they complete treatment? So, at every point you have 10 to 15 percent falling off, disappearing. Now, for many years we used the smear microscopy which was developed by Robert Koch 120, 30 years ago and we were still using it in the 21st century to make a diagnosis of TB. We did not have anything better than that till we had the PCR and all that for many years, but there was no standardized way. So, you did a PCR, I did a PCR, the results used to be different. This system is a cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. So, we put everything into this box, there is minimal uh, stuff that has to be done by the lab technician just mix it in that and then put it in here and essentially in 90 minutes you get a result of both TB detection as well as the rifampicin resistance because it is targeting the RPOB gene that also has the mutations. We now have a number of innovators who are trying to come out with simpler better systems for point of care TB diagnostics and if you look at the one right in the middle on the upper row it is a company called Mall Bio in Bangalore that's developed this test called the TrueNAT. It's a small battery operated. It's again a PCR based technology. You can see the mobile phone uh, system so that data can be easily transmitted. It's a small chip, so it's easy disposable disposal compared to the big plastic cups you have to dispose with the other thing, and uh, and also they've developed this platform for multiple pathogens. So, you can if you put it in a primary health center, you can use it not only for TB, but for influenza, for dengue, for, for uh, malaria. So, they have at least for hepatitis. So, we have now validated this and uh, hopefully the government will now start scaling up so that we can move away from smear microscopy, which is so variable, so poor in sensitivity, so dependent on the lab technician, on the microscope. I have gone to PHCs where you look through the microscope you can see nothing and then you ask the lab technician how are you reporting smears. So, they are just cooking up results. Um, so, this would improve the case detection and hopefully bring in uh, 
much more uh, accuracy. It will also tell us resistance so that patients can get the right treatment. There is also Chinese companies doing it, so several companies that are working. So there are lots of molecular diagnostics now. What we need is point of care. Of course, uh, the cost has to be affordable. And this slide you can't read from there essentially shows the pipeline of new diagnostics. But if you look at the right hand column, which is the final phase, WHO evaluates and approves it, very few. So lots on the earlier stages looking at different ways of detecting culture based, molecular detection, uh, looking at active uh, biomarkers. I will come to that in a minute. Breath, breath based assays, ICGB was working on breath and urine based detection, uh, Professor Chauhan group was working on that. Um, nothing really uh, very good has come out. A lot of other groups are working as well, antigen and antibody based and so on. Imaging, you know, traditionally x-rays, x-rays have their own problems of sensitivity and specificity. So these kind of imaging techniques which combine structural and functional. So if you use the uh, radio labeled isotopes, you can then get uh, the points of inflammation can uh, will light up. and. Uh, so if you look at that uh, image, you can see the granulomas lighting up and this was in, in mice. As you treat them, you can see some granulomas are disappearing, healing, others are coming up. So it's a very dynamic state. And the other thing that is of great interest is a blood based signature. So obviously a blood based test is much easier to do than any other kind of test. And here. The aim is to look for a test or a biomarker that can predict. So I mentioned 40 percent of us in this room are skin test positive. Now if we knew that okay, X and Y were going to high, high risk for developing TB, the rest are at low risk, then you could take X and Y and give them some particular preventive therapy instead of treating everyone in this room with uh, drugs which are unnecessary. So that is why a lot of research is trying to look at predictive. So this particular 16 gene. RNA signature, it was tested in South Africa, was able to discriminate. So basically they took people, adolescents and they were following them up and some of them kept developing TB. So if you look at the lower band between 1 day and 180 days before the development of TB, this particular 16 gene signature had a very high, I think something like 80, 85 percent sensitivity to predict the development of TB. But as you go further back in time, 180 through 360 days, I think had less than 50 percent sensitivity and beyond that you really could not predict. But just before development of TB, yes, you can clearly differentiate the progressors and the non-progressors. So this is another area of research which needs cohorts, it needs prospective cohorts. So this is the kind of study you have to plan and you have to follow, you have to invest you have to follow people large numbers for a long period of time. Some of them will develop TB. You need to have a biorepository, you need to have all the uh, specimens available and then you can do studies looking at. So we have got 5 cohorts in India now uh, which are gathering data like this on patients, on household contacts so that over a period of time we will have a good enough biorepository that we can ask a lot of questions. So, some of the research challenges around pathogenesis are, are the ones that are listed here. We need to a lot more systems biology work to understand the interactions between pathogen and host and uh, someone mentioned the understanding of mechanism of latency and how does the disease get activated. Then of course there are groups that are working on PET and PET CT, um, it's expensive technologies we, we can't use them in clinical care. But certainly this could be used in clinical trials and so on and also to probe drug responses. So with HIV there are other challenges, uh, HIV is a big risk factor, there are higher rates of progression and we need to, we do not have many models of dual infection, diagnostics we talked about. So then we move on to uh, therapies. And um, one of the challenges of TB is that you know you have to currently treat people for at least 6 months. If you have drug resistant TB then the treatment is of 2 years. So ideally what do we want? We want a simple once daily few pills, few side effects should be compatible with uh, HIV drugs uh, and other drugs which people may be taking. Uh, 
uh, maybe we want to cure them in two weeks or three weeks just like a course of antibiotics we don't want to go on for six months because most people stop taking treatment after a few weeks they start feeling better so that's a big problem but all the trials that have been done so far that are listed here some of them using you know these drugs like uh, moxifloxacin and so on have not shown that it's possible to reduce treatment but there are new drugs and here's a pipeline after many many years actually we have two new drugs that have been approved for TB called bedaquiline and delaminate uh, this is rifampicin was discovered in the 70s and after that there's been no new drug for TB so it also shows you that big drug companies multinationals are not going to invest in drugs for neglected diseases or diseases that do not affect people in the west and the developing countries have not invested either so in India we have generic companies that do excellent work producing generic drugs but only now very recently they have increased their R&D uh, outputs so that uh, so there is a big case for investing for countries like India and China and Brazil to invest much more on new drug development and the open source drug discovery uh, which CSIR had a few years ago was trying to do that was trying to use genomics and using students actually and virtual researchers from all over the world to identify new targets both for TB and malaria that project unfortunately closed down but there is quite a lot of knowledge that was generated and that's available for people to use but you know it's one thing to find a target theoretically and quite another thing to then identify the molecules and then take it all the way through the different stages of testing so out of every 10,000 molecules that start that process only one makes it out at the other end and into the clinic so that is why it requires quite a lot of investment and private pharma may or may not be interested in that so we'll have to find new models of partnering to to develop drugs and that's not only for TB but that's for other diseases like TB as well this was one of the new drugs that uh, was a new uh, target the mycobacterial ATP synthase inhibitor it seems to have very good properties but it also had some toxicity in some of the earlier studies some cardiac toxicity so people have gone a bit slow but you can see compared to the placebo that when you add this drug it, it uh, makes the uh, sputum negative much faster this is all for drug resistant TB patients similarly 60% versus 40% outcomes at the end of two years and this drug has been introduced in India at currently only at in six states but will be expanded soon the other drug is delaminate again you can see 29% versus 45% response when you add delaminate to the standard MDR-TB treatment linezolid is a drug that was already used for treatment of staph infections it's also been found to be good for TB but has a lot of side effects so one of the problems of treating drug resistant TB is that not only uh, is it a very long course of treatment a lot of side effects relatively a lot of side effects so tanamycin injections can make you deaf and very often patients have to choose between going deaf and having their TB it's really very pathetic because when the patient asks you that I'm losing my hearing what should I do but then you have no choice to say you know if you want to live then your TB has to get cured so young children and you know young people getting deaf because of treatment this linezolid is also a very toxic drug causes neuropathy and I know young people who've completely lost all sensation uh, because they had to take this drug uh, for two years similarly there are other compounds but again all of them are going through different phases of testing by adding uh, this drug moxifloxacin you can see the way we compare you know TB treatment outcomes you look at culture conversion you keep culturing the sputum every few weeks you can see that it's much faster when you add that drug and then at the end of treatment you had over 90 percent of patients becoming culture negative and then the other thing you look for always is relapse because TB if you take antibiotics for TB you can be culture negative in two months and then you stop two months later you have a relapse which means the bacteria haven't fully got sterilized so they're just suppressed so relapse rates are an important important uh, outcome and that's why the TB trials take a very long time you have to follow people for at least one year if not two years 
So you can see the three month regimen, the top regimen is which is called M3 was a three month regimen. It had a 20 percent uh, almost 20 percent relapse rate. The other regimens were okay, 4 to 5 percent relapse is acceptable. There are number of trials going around the world now. There is something called the stream study that is trying to shorten MDR-TB treatment. So, those are all drug combinations to kill the bacteria, but there are also now approaches to treatment using host directed therapy. So, you try to make the immune system stronger and this is using repurposed drugs. So, repurposing is a drug that is already being used for something else like an asthma drug or a diabetes drug, but it has been found to have some impact effect on the immune system you try and use it for TB as an adjunct therapy. So, number of drugs which are currently under trial including uh, checkpoint inhibitors and therapeutic vaccines including the vaccine that was developed by Dr. Talwar at NII the uh, Mycobacterium indicus pranai vaccine which uh, was he developed it to prevent leprosy, uh, but it turns out it, it has a very good therapeutic effect both in leprosy as well as in many kinds of cancer because it, it seems to stimulate the, uh, the uh, cell mediated immune response, the T cell response. For TB it is been tried as a therapeutic, it has not been shown to be very effective, but there may be some situations where it is useful. Similarly, a drug called metformin which is very commonly used to treat diabetes. It was observed that people who had diabetes and TB and who were getting metformin had lower mortality and lower cavities. So, that is a drug that is being further taken up for research. And uh, one of the questions is why do we have to take, uh, treat TB for so long when other bacteria you can treat in a few weeks. So, one of the mechanisms that it uses is a uh, efflux pumps which get turned on when the bacteria is inside the macrophages. So, the macrophages uh, induced efflux pumps and so the idea came that many of the bacteria turn on their efflux pumps and so they survive within the macrophages, they do not get killed by bacteria. If you add an efflux pump inhibitor, then you should be able to theoretically kill more bacteria than without with, with just the antimicrobial drugs alone. So, we designed a clinical trial to test this hypothesis using a efflux pump inhibitor called verapamil that is a commonly used antihypertensive drug and that works against both rifampicin and INH efflux pumps um, and that trial is still <coughs> going on. So, this was some mouse work that showed that verapamil might be a good adjunct to TB therapy and this study was funded by DBT and it is going on. So, some of the challenges like I mentioned in treatment are all of these which need uh, better drug combinations and of course, for HIV again we have a number of other challenges. Now, pharmacokinetics is some area which has not received a lot of attention um, and now we know that a number of factors including the drug polymorph, the polymorphisms in the enzymes that metabolize drugs. So, the acetylator, the N-acetyl uh, transferase is an enzyme that metabolizes isoniazid and you can be a, you can be a rapid metabolizer or a slow metabolizer. So, depending on that your blood levels will vary and it does have an impact on treatment. Similarly, for rifampicin then age is an important factor, drug interactions, drug food interactions, nutritional status. So, when we are doing these studies in children, we found by doing some modeling that for young children you actually need much much higher doses of rifampicin to achieve the same blood levels as you need for an adult. So, the standard dose is 10 milligram per kilogram, but and that is what everybody gets now, but you can see that in young children you probably need closer to 20 milligrams per kilogram and this can only be this was found out because of all the pharmacokinetic studies that we did and um, this has also resulted in changes in the treatment guidelines for children. Now, latent infection, latent infection uh, as we said majority of people remain completely well asymptomatic and you have yeah 
two, over 2 billion infected people and 10 million new TB cases every year globally. And these are the methods by which you can diagnose latent infection. I mentioned at the beginning, you can either have a skin test, what's called a MAN2 test. It's been used again for more than a century. It has a lot of issues with false negatives and false positives. Or you can have these interferon gamma release assays, which is the same thing, but you're doing it in a test tube. Now people are trying to come up with a better skin test using more specific antigens from M tuberculosis so that you don't get all the false positivity. And so if you combine a skin test is simple to do, but at the same time you are using very specific antigens, then the CTB test may be a better diagnostic, but this is still under development and evaluation. But we do not have a better test right now for latent TB infection. So, latent infection is treated in some countries like I said, if you go to a low endemic country like US, then you will be offered some of these treatment regimens, standard was isoniazid, but now there is another regimen which is used, which is a combination of these two drugs, rifapentine and INH, just once a week for 12 doses. So, this is a very attractive way of treating latent infection, just 12 doses and it is found to be as effective, if not more effective than 6 months of isoniazid. But in India currently we are, we offer latent TB treatment only to children under 6 years and HIV positive people because they are at high risk for developing active disease. So finally, uh, you know these are some of the global uh, declines. You can see the, the way that TB has been declining very, very slowly at 1.5 percent a year. The, uh, to reach elimination target, that is the purple line that you have to achieve more than 20 percent a year. And it is felt that unless we can introduce new tools and a good vaccine or a much better prophylactic regimen and a point of care test, we may not be able to really bend the curve. So, you can keep going uh, by optimizing the use of current tools, you will achieve some gains, but not a whole lot of gains. And this is a modeling that was done specifically for the Southeast Asia region, again to show the red line is you know where we are today, or rather the blue line is where we are today. The red line would be if we actually start doing the program much better. And then the yellow line is if we start going out into the community and doing active case detection and finding a lot more people. But the purple line, which is what is needed to achieve the goal of elimination and India of course has said 2025 instead of 2035, we would need uh, a lot of, well something which is a mass preventive measure and vaccines, there are some in the pipeline, but there is nothing really that looks like it is much better than BCG or that is going to replace uh, BCG anytime soon. So, there are a number of research priorities as far as vaccines are concerned, but the very basic one is to understand the immune responses, to understand protective immunity and also how do we better diagnose and treat latent infection. So these are some of the other research priorities that are listed here. So practically any aspect of TB as I have described, there, there are research questions which need to be addressed. Why do some people progress from latent infection? You know, how do you uh, use genotyping to measure the risk of activation and so on. Okay. So, BCG is still recommended in children, we are still giving it to all our newborns, but it only protects for the first few years of life, it does not prevent adult TB and also it is not safe in HIV, it can cause disseminated BCG infection. So, in South Africa and countries where HIV is very common, they are really uh, worried to give BCG now because it can actually kill by becoming uh, a disease. So, I want to end by telling you what the ICMR is doing as far as uh, to address this big problem. So, on the left hand side you have Ministry of Health, you know it has a national strategic plan uh, with very ambitious goals, active screening of everybody in the community, expand drug resistance testing, free drugs and diagnostics for all TB patients, does not matter if you are in the private sector or the public sector, social security, nutrition support, etcetera. But on this side is the new tool development, 
So, we convened all the science agencies DBT, DST and then we had ministry of on board, we had all our partners globally on board as well and we came out with some priorities where uh, you need uh, scientists really to, to address some of these. So, that is the vision of the India TB research consortium that unless we, uh, we uh, to develop new tools, invest in developing new tools in order to achieve elimination. And of course, it is going to be helpful globally not just for India. So, we have four groups, working groups, diagnostics, vaccines, drugs and implementation research. And in the last year or so, we have made fair amount of progress. I already told you about the diagnostics. We have moved ahead with this indigenous diagnostic we have completed the validation and hopefully it should find its way into the program. As far as therapeutics, a number of clinical trials have been developed using metformin, using a combination of new drugs like bedaquiline and delaminid, high dose rifampicin. So, we are right now engaged in selecting the sites for these trials, building capacity and training. And then for vaccines, we have identified several vaccine candidates from groups around the world. So, what we want to do is a head to head trial of some of the best vaccine, most promising vaccine candidates in India among household contacts. Household contacts are at high risk of developing TB. Now, this will be a very ambitious large trial, it will probably cost over 100 crores, but nobody globally has been able to do a trial like this with different vaccine candidates, but we brought all the partners around the table, people are willing to, to work together. and. Uh, so, we hope we will be able to get the support to take that forward. And as far as implementation research is concerned, it is really a question of how do you improve the program in terms of its uh, uh, quality as well as its outreach. So, I am just put up the slide to show that you know the ICMR is among the top funders of TB R&D globally. Uh, we were higher up in 2015, I think the latest report I saw, but we are still within the top 10 funders. Of course, the amount that the NIH spends, for example, is uh, 200 million on, but they spend much more on HIV, for example. But uh, the ICMR spends, say, 8 million dollars, but other agencies also, uh, DBT and DST, also support uh, TBRND. So, the idea really is to have uh, more of a coordinated mission mode kind of a program. So, that all these bits of funding can add up into a portfolio of uh, potential products that could then be translated. But it requires a lot of coordination between the basic scientists because you find almost every other day there is a paper published from some lab in India on either a new pathway or a, or a new drug target or, or, a, or some molecular study. Now, what happens? It is a paper, it is either a PhD student or a postdoc. Now, from that to really take it through the next step. Like I said, it has to then go through a lot of preclinical testing, then it goes into animal testing, then you know you have to have a GMP production. So, you need a, a partner who is a commercial partner and then it will go into phase 1 trials. In India, we do not have in the government sector a good phase 1 trial site. That is one of the things we want to try and build. And then into phase 2 and 3 trials, it will take 10 to 15 years minimum if everything goes well you know more like 20 years maybe 15 to 20 years it needs resources and it needs commitment so whether it's a vaccine or a drug it's a long process and lots of different groups need to be involved so this is where we need to have that the consortium which uh, meets often where all the different partners come together and say okay let's look at the landscape what's out there in india or outside india what looks most promising and how do we take that forward. So, that is the kind of mandate that we have in the consortium and thank you.